wondering what a debt to income ratio is? Or are you unsure about how it is used? Can money really buy happiness? All of this and more on today's episode of The Secret Life of Numbers. Welcome to the Secret Life of Numbers podcast, the podcast where we dissect everyday numbers and statistics to find the stories behind them. Each episode, we take a number or statistic and break it down. We will tell you where it comes from and what it means for you. Along the way, hopefully we will inspire you to think about the numbers in your own life. I'm Lavanya, your data scientist on call. I'll be breaking down the numbers. I'm Lindsay, your data translator. For when Lavanya gets too technical on us, I'll be breaking down the rest. (laughs) All right, let's jump in. So, Lindsay, this is actually the third and final episode in our three-part mini-series. That's exciting, but I'm also a little sad to be leaving our realm of finance seeds and personal finance. Yeah. So for those of you who are just joining us, this is the third episode in a mini-series about personal finances. So in the first one, we talked about compound interest. And then the second, we talked about credit cards. And this final episode, we're going to be talking about the debt to income ratio. I'm so excited because this is something that I feel like you don't often hear a lot about until you're in a situation where you need a good debt to income ratio. (laughs) Yeah, you don't you don't know what it is until you need to know. (laughs) Exactly. It's a need to know number. (laughs) One thing I'd like to stress is that finances and personal finances can seem scary, but if you break it down into small pieces like we've been doing in these episodes, it becomes very manageable. Yes. And Mm -hmm. as far as I know, the math is pretty simple on this debt to income ratio. Oh, yes. So this is actually the simplest of the three mathy topics that we've been going through. In fact, this one, as the name suggests, is just a ratio. So it's literally your debt divided by your income to give you your debt to income ratio. That is the kind of math we like to see. (laughs) There are a few caveats when we calculate your debt to income ratio. And one of those is that you're always using your net income in this calculation. So just to give you a little bit of information about what your net income is compared to your gross. So gross income is typically the larger number because this is the total income before you account for your deductions. So your deductions could be your taxes if you're paying into a pension plan, for example. And then the net income is your take-home pay. So your gross is what you make, air quotations, but then your net is what you actually end up receiving after all of those deductions, I guess, are taken off. Exactly. Let's do an example for this debt to income ratio. Yeah, let's do it. All right. So let's say you have a monthly net income of $5,000. So that's after your taxes have been removed from your paycheck, after your contributions to your pension plan. At the end of the month, you're left with $5,000. And then let's add up all your debt payments. So some debt payments that are included in your debt to income ratio are like your credit card payment, your student loan, your monthly mortgage, because we're because we're calculating this on a monthly basis. So let's say after you add all of that up, you have total debt of $2,500. So then your ratio would just be 2,500 divided by 5,000 multiplied by 100 to give you a percent. So that ratio would be 50%. So question for you, Lindsay, do you think this is a good debt to income ratio or would you consider this a happy place to be or a stable place financially? I think it depends on stage of life to to a certain degree, right? Like I think if you're like a fresh grad and you're paying off student Mm -hmm. loans or like you just bought a house, like it's doable, but 50% seems really high. It is, right? I mean, I chose 50% for this example just because it's easy to calculate. But if you think about what that would mean, 
that would mean of the take-home pay that you're playing with, 50% is just going to pay off debt. So you really only have half of what you bring home to do things like groceries or to pay for your cell phone or your childcare costs. That's a really good point because deductions that aren't included in the debt to income ratio doesn't mm-hmm. include fixed costs. Like what you said, like groceries, cell phone bill, childcare, gas, car insurance, none of that is included in what's taken off. So that all has to come out of your remaining 50% of the income in this case. Exactly. So Everyone has a different opinion, let's say, about what a good debt-to-income ratio is. Different banks, for different purposes, will have different ratios that they consider acceptable. Right. So I pulled some information from Desjardins, which is a bank here in Canada, and they say that a debt-to-income ratio of 30% is excellent, and 30 to 36 is acceptable, while a ratio higher than 40 could make creditors reject your application for an auto loan, student loan, or mortgage. Plus, they say it's also a sign that you're in financial trouble. I feel like, well, we do have these benchmarks. Like, obviously, Mm -hmm. a lower debt-to-income ratio is favorable, right? You want to minimize debt, maximize income. But I feel like sometimes it also really depends on the whole person. (laughs) Debt-to-income ratio is one of the things that they'll look at when deciding whether or not to loan you money. But it's not the only thing. Yeah. But one of the Mm -hmm. nice things about debt to income ratio, I guess, is it's maybe a bit more objective than other measures that might be used. It's a good place to start, let's say. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And I think also banks and creditors, they like to use this debt to income ratio as a way to see if you're like good with money. Right. So one of the other measures would be a credit score. Yes. How are those related? Related or different? Or do they Mm -hmm. tell you different things about your financial landscape? So your credit score talks about your past credit behavior, but your debt to income ratio is kind of a snapshot of your current financial situation. Right. So your debt to income ratio could be used by a creditor to see if they're willing to give you a credit card. (laughs) Yes. But nonetheless, like even though your credit score is your past financial and your debt to income ratio is your present, if you carry a lot of debt, that will be reflected in your credit score. Right. Right. Mm -hmm. Which we didn't talk explicitly about credit scores. That could be a good episode in the future. (laughs) But we talked about credit cards, which contribute to your credit score. And also your credit card debt is included in that monthly calculation or is included in your debt to income ratio. Right. Right. So Mm -hmm. that's also reflected there. So 40% sounds like kind of the high end of where where you want to be. Even if we just think about it from like a personal perspective, if 40% of the money that you have available to you is tied up in paying off debts, I feel like that's going to make your living costs very hard to cover. Right. Especially in different Mm -hmm. areas in Canada where we live, like the cost of housing Mm -hmm. is, (laughs) they keep talking about the bubble, but it never seems to burst. It keeps going (laughs) up and up and up. Yeah, that's true. I did read recently that the Canadian housing market is like increasing very quickly compared to like other nations. I did look up debt to income ratios in some of the major Canadian cities, and this is published by Statistics Canada. Can you guess where you think some of the highest debt to income ratios are? Well, I'm thinking Vancouver. Housing is, it's, it's no secret that housing in Vancouver is extremely expensive. So I'm thinking Vancouver is probably going to be pretty high. Mm-hmm. And housing in Toronto is also extraordinarily expensive. So I'm thinking those are going to be kind of our major cities where it's, it's especially bad. So actually, according to this report, in Victoria, Vancouver, and Toronto, debt-to-income ratios exceeded 200% in 2016. I believe this report is using your debt-to-income ratio on a yearly basis. So what that means is that a household with $50,000 after-tax income had over $100,000 in debt in these cities. Wow. So Mm -hmm. where is it the highest out of those three? It is Victoria, 240%. Then Vancouver with 230 and Toronto with 210. I'm kind of surprised that Victoria is more than Vancouver. 
Really? Well, it is 2016. It could have changed now into 2021, but yeah. I haven't seen a, a newer report yet. No, but that's super interesting because, like, I think most people think that, like, in BC, Vancouver mm -hmm. is the most expensive city to live in, <laughs> which, like, maybe it still is more expensive, but maybe people are taking on more debt in Victoria. I guess it would be interesting maybe. to look into the different trends that are there. For sure. We've talked about the debt to income ratio and specifically how we calculate it and some of the, I guess, expenses that are included in this calculation as well as what's not. And we've also discussed that according to at least Desjardins and most banks, 40% is really kind of the limit to the debt to income ratio, at least on a monthly basis that you want to have. So after the break, we're going to come back and talk a little bit about what impact that can have in your everyday life. Welcome back. Before the break, we talked about how we calculate a debt-to-income ratio, but now we're going to talk about the impacts that that debt-to-income ratio can have. So, Lindsay, do you want to take it away? Yes. Thanks, Lavanya. So, debt-to-income ratio has a lot of kind of surface-level impacts. Mm -hmm. So, you know, obviously it affects your ability to get a mortgage, the kind of interest rates lenders are willing to give you. So when we started to think a little bit more about debt to income ratio, I think we both started to think more critically about why we accumulate debt, right? Mm -hmm. And, and yes. why it can be so much harder to get out of debt uh, than it is to get into it. And I will admit, I first found out about this theory on Instagram. Someone posted about it and I thought it was really interesting. So I looked into the original text by the original author. And basically, there's this novel called Men at Arms by Terry Pratchett. And mm -hmm. in it, the Sam Vines Boots Theory of Wealth. That's outlined in the book. I haven't read the whole book, but I just, I think that this theory can really illustrate why it can be so hard to get out of debt. Okay. It comes down to the idea, really, that it's cheap to be rich, but it's expensive to be poor. Oh, interesting. Do you have an example? So the example in the book is about work boots. Let's take someone who earns $38 a month, uh, which is the example in the book. And mm -hmm. the thing is, a really good pair of leather boots is about $50. But an affordable pair of boots that's kind of okay for a season, and then they leak, and they, you know, give out. They cost ten dollars, okay. but these were the kind of boots that Sam Vines in the book always bought, and basically he wore them out every season. Okay. But the thing about the fifty-dollar pair of boots is that they last for a long time, years and years and years. If you can afford the fifty-dollar pair of boots up front, you're going to have them for you know ten years, let's say. Well, the poor man who had to buy the, the ten-dollar pair of boots every time over ten years. If he bought a new pair every year, he's going to spend $100 on boots and he's still going to have wet feet. Yeah. I guess if you don't have the purchasing power to make investment like these expensive boots that will last you a long time, you'll end up spending more money in the long run. Exactly. And it kind of illustrates that point of it's cheaper to be wealthy because in this example, you could get the $50 pair of boots up front. Yeah. And not have to worry about it. Exactly. And then save the extra $50 that someone spent every year because their boots kept giving out, but all they could afford at the time, each time, was a $10 pair of boots. Mm -hmm. I think this example kind of leads into a broader discussion of the relationship between money and happiness mm. and how much money we need to be happy. Does having a lot of money affect your mental health? Does not having a lot of money affect your mental health? And there's a lot of really interesting research that I found looking into money and happiness. I, I'm very curious because I have heard that after a certain point in your earnings, money no longer contributes to your happiness. Yes. So that's what we call the satiation point, like the income satiation or okay. turning point. Um, right. So satiation meaning just kind of you're satisfied with the level of money you have. And that's the point where, you know, you kind of hit a plateau of like more money isn't going to make you any happier. Mm hmm. And one thing that I found really interesting is that this is actually a super active area of research. Oh, when I was doing my research, I found that a lot of the research started happening around 2008 with the, the economic crisis. So 
it's not surprising, at least to me, why there's so much. <laughs> yeah. And mm-hmm. one of the things that's really interesting is, you know, on some topics, a lot of the research is quite old and has kind of been sussed out. But one of the maybe earlier papers on that kind of income satiation, like you mentioned, kind of came out at the tail end of the Great Recession. So it was published in 2010 mm-hmm. in um, the Proceedings of the National Academy of Sciences. And it's a study by Kahneman and Deaton. And it's all about the relationship between income and life evaluation and emotional well-being. Yeah. What is life evaluation? Is that how much my life is worth? Or is that how much I value my life? They have their own definition of life evaluation, which in their study, they say refers to the thoughts that people have about their life when they think about it. Okay. Which I think is kind of a roundabout answer. <laughs> so I guess that's whether or not they think they're happy or they feel happy or sad. Or do they feel satisfied when they reflect on their life? Do they feel okay. exactly happy or sad? Do they feel disappointed? Okay. Were there categories or was it just like open-ended how you feel about your life? It was more upon a continuum. Do you have really low life evaluation? Meaning when you think about it, it's quite negative. Okay. Or... Is it increasing so that it's quite positive when you reflect on your life? It's positive thoughts that you have about it. They analyzed more than 450,000 responses to the Gallup Healthways Wellbeing Index, which surveyed a lot of U.S. residents and was conducted by the Gallup organization. And basically, they found that when plotted against log of income, so life evaluation kept increasing steadily. So as income increased life evaluation increased. Okay. And they found the same relationship with emotional well-being. However, at $75,000 a year annual income, emotional well-being hit a plateau, meaning that if you made more money, you didn't have an improved emotional well-being after $75,000. But they weren't able to find that same kind of plateau or turning point with life evaluation. Okay, so emotionally, as you make more, you feel better to a certain extent. But there is no such like turning point in whether or not you're satisfied or unsatisfied with your life. Exactly. Their conclusion was that a higher income buys life satisfaction, but not happiness. However, there's a few limitations to the study. Mm -hmm. Like they didn't look at income as a continuous variable. They had categories of income categorical data. (laughs) Exactly. (laughs) Categorical data is notoriously difficult to analyze. Right, because in that box of income, like we don't necessarily know was everyone at the higher end of that box or... Bidding is always difficult. You're trying to find relationships between your range and behaviors, but you don't know if you binned correctly, for example. Like there's a whole process of figuring out if your bins are accurate before you can even begin modeling. Exactly. And like where you draw those lines of like, okay, are we going to bin high income as everything, you know, $80,000 a year plus? Is it $100,000 a year plus? Like, Mm -hmm. where do we draw those lines? Because that's really going to affect your analysis. How big do we make the bins? How many bins? A lot of studies about how do we delineate what we're even looking at? Like you said, before you even get to the scientific model of what are we? Yeah, what are we after? I think it's also difficult to do well. Yes, because it, it can be subjective. At some point, there's a decision made about <laughs> that this is the bucket that we are throwing our things into. <laughs> yeah. And you just hope you have a good bucket. <laughs> yes. You just hope that you you binned correctly or you didn't bin to create bias. Yes. And that can be really hard to evaluate in your own bin. Bins aside, we mm-hmm. also have a study okay. more recent. It was done in 2018 All right. by Jeb et al. Um, and it was published in Nature, Human Behavior. They also looked at income satiation, but they had income, again, as this continuous variable. Okay. And then they had three subjective measures of well-being. Okay. So they also looked at life evaluation using... They didn't exactly define it in their study, but I was guessing because that they kept citing the 2010 study that... They were using a similar measure. Okay. And then they also looked at positive effect and negative effect. Effect being with an A, A -A Mm A-F-F-E-C-T. 
So as their income variable, they use yearly household equivalent income, which is essentially U.S. dollars, um, and they controlled for the number of people within each household. So what they're talking about is a single person. Okay. So they also used a Gallup World Poll. There were 1.7 million respondents, and they represented 164 countries worldwide. I have a question for you, Lavinia. Yes. What do you think the income satiation level is for life evaluation globally? Globally? Okay, so the last study, it was around 75,000? Yes, but that was looking specifically at the U.S., and it was categorical data. Okay, I, I think maybe globally it might be a bit higher. Care to put a number on it? Um, okay, uh, 80,000 maybe? This is just me guessing. <laughs> okay, you're, you're close. You're close. So it's, it's $95,000 a year for life evaluation, where we see that satiation point where more money will bring you better life evaluation. Okay. Um, and then it's sixty to $75,000 a year for emotional well-being. Okay. And one of the things that I found really interesting about this study is they looked at a lot of different groups and categories. So... They divided the world by regions to see how it changed. They also looked at men and women to see if there was a statistically significant difference between income satiation. Mm -hmm. And there wasn't a significant difference. But one thing I found interesting is life evaluation satiated at a higher point for women. Than for men? Yeah. But the difference wasn't statistically significant. So Okay. But there was a difference based on the education level. Okay. So if you are more educated? Does it take more earnings to become satiated? Yeah, exactly. Mm -hmm. And there's like a few different ideas of why that is, right? Like it might depend on, well, like, first of all, you might have a higher earning potential, not always, but it's possible that you have an overall higher earning potential. Mm -hmm. And then also part of it can be the group of people that you are in now. Oh, that you're comparing yourself to. Exactly. Mm -hmm. So one thing that I found really interesting, however, was that, so they looked at single person households, Mm -hmm. but they figured out a way that you can determine income satiation for families. And so basically they, you multiply the satiation point, the income by the square root of a household size. Okay. So if the household is four people, the square root is two. Yeah. So you double it essentially. So Um, As an example, in North America, a family of four would have a satiation point of $210,000 a year. Okay. So that would mean that mom and dad need to bring in $200,000 a year for the entire family to be satiated. Exactly. But this is also like there's, that's not necessarily saying to be happy, you have to hit this, (laughs) this point. It's just saying that based on this study, after that point, you won't increase in happiness. I see. Or life evaluation, really, which is kind of a measure of that. That's quite high. That's like 100000 a person, like if it's a two-income household. I thought it was quite high as well. Mm-hmm. But there, there's an interesting point brought up in the paper, which is the concept of a hedonic treadmill which is really just this idea that happiness often returns to baseline, your baseline happiness level, even like after those promotions or mm. big life events, right? So so let's say you get a really big promotion at work. Transiently, your happiness could increase, but it tends to return to your baseline happiness before the promotion. Mm. I see. So I have a question. Did you find anything related to debt and your mental health? You know what? I did not. I looked more into like the <laughs> the happiness side of it. But I'm curious if you found anything on debt and mental health. So I did look at a systematic study. So they were looking at many different papers that looked at debt and mental health. They mentioned that this became very important to study after the economic crisis. Right. So many of the studies that they reviewed said they were longitudinal. Because of the methods, it's difficult to demonstrate whether being in debt for long periods of time creates poor mental health. However, there is plausible quantitative data 
which indicates that indebtedness can contribute to the development of mental health problems, like anxiety, for example. Right. Maybe Mm -hmm. you're more anxious. And Mm -hmm. like, it's kind of interesting, too, because the relationship between events in your life and then your mental health isn't like it depends on a lot of personal factors, like your personal resilience, your personal susceptibility Mm -hmm. and your baseline of your outlook on life, of of Mm -hmm. your social support networks, of, of all of those things. One thing that was interesting in this paper that I read is that there was a study and it was reviewing credit card debt in particular. And the participants in the study, they weren't more stressed about carrying credit card debt. But what created the anxiety or the additional stress was the missing of a minimum payment. Oh, so they weren't worried so much about the debt. It was the anxiety of I missed a payment. Yeah, it was the anxiety of not being able to pay back. Right. Mm -hmm. It's interesting that that's distinguished from the debt. That kind of brings us to debt management, which I wanted to chat about. Okay, so a few weeks ago, Mm -hmm. I fell down a YouTube rabbit hole of Dave Ramsey's (laughs) show where people phone in with like their debt and their financial situation. And he gives them advice on air about how to manage it, how to get out of it. Mm -hmm. And there's like a few phrases that he always says that I think are so funny. It's always like, sell the house, trade in the car, (laughs) like beans and rice, rice and beans. (laughs) But one of the things he talks about when people phone in and they have like multiple debts, right? So maybe they have a mortgage, they have student loans, they have personal debt on like credit cards, they have a car payment because they're wondering, how do I even start? Yes. And one of the things he says is it's going to be a long journey. So you're going to need a little bit of momentum. So you should try to pay off some of the smaller loans just to get a little bit of momentum and a little bit of that satisfaction for you and encouragement to keep going and tackle those really large ones like mortgage debt, for example. Mm -hmm. So you're absolutely right. And I believe Dave Ramsey calls that the snowball effect. Right. Yes. Yes. And so I did some research and in particular found a paper that looked at something called debt aversion, that feeling that you don't want to have multiple debts. Right. Because we don't want to have multiple debts, for example, like we don't want to have the car debt and we don't want to have the mortgage and the credit card and the student loan, like that number of debts is overwhelming to us. What we'll try to do is we'll try to decrease the number of debts that we hold, but not the total overall amount of debt. Right. So you might actually end up spending more money in the long run paying off your debts if you do that snowball method of Let's knock out the little ones first Mm -hmm. so we can build up the momentum for the big ones. Yes. From a purely mathematical perspective, the way to pay like the least amount for your debts would be look at all of the debts that you hold, pay the minimum amount on all of them. And then the one with the highest interest rate, that's where you put all your extra funds. And then once you pay off that debt, you move to the one that had the second highest interest rate, which now has the highest and you continue to pay minimums on everything while paying down the highest. And then this will ensure that you pay the least amount of interest overall and therefore the least amount of debt payments overall. During this method, though, you might not get that satisfaction of, okay, I had maybe five debts to begin with and now I have three. Exactly, because you're still carrying, you still might carry all five but you're paying off in such a way that you're not incurring like maximum interest. Right. So mm-hmm. so Dave Ramsey's method was the snowball method. And then does this one have a name as well? They call this the normative method mm-hmm. or like from a normative perspective. I mean, I should say that debt aversion is not necessarily bad because if you are worried about the number of debts that you hold and you're paying off your small debts, Like you're not buying new things that could incur more debts. Ideally. (laughs) Ideally, yes. And then also, if, for example, the small debts have the highest interest rates, like you're working on this normative perspective. And that's very well possible, too, with what we learned about like daily compounding on credit cards. Like that can be a really high interest rate, right? Mm -hmm. Exactly. 
And part of me wonders with like the snowball method, if it's maybe not so much about the math as the psychology of that, of we need to build up some some stamina, some momentum yeah. to get you incentivized to keep paying it off. Because once you pay off that first little small one, you'll, you know, feel really good about it. Yeah, because we know that being in debt for a long period of time can start to affect your mental health. Or there's some evidence to suggest that. Right. Mm-hmm. And then that also affects your ability to continue paying. <laughs> Exactly. And then also your kind of income, if you have a ton of debt, even if you're at the satiation point for life evaluation of $95,000 a year globally, you might not actually be at that satiation point because you're spending so much of it Mm -hmm. paying off debt. Yes, exactly. Right. So we will have all of our resources that we looked at for debt management, as well as all the other references from the show in our show notes, if our listeners want to read a little bit more about debt management strategies. Mm -hmm. Sylvania, do you know what time it is? I don't, Lindsay. (laughs) (laughs) Actually, I do. I was only joking. (laughs) It's such a shock. We we aren't sure what's coming. But as you all know, it's time for our science seed. So each episode, we like to give our listeners something to think about. A science nugget, if you will, to help you think more critically about the numbers and statistics that you hear every day. And during our finance mini-series, we have switched up our science seed to be a, wait for it, wait for it, finance seed. (laughs) So our final takeaway from this series is that income is about the net, not the gross. We learned about this when we were calculating the debt-to-income ratio because it's the net income that goes into it and not the gross income. Exactly. This is a good principle for staying out of debt. Like when you find out the salary for a job, Mm -hmm. you might be really excited about it. And and that's great. But you need to think about what tax bracket am I in, right? Like if you're getting a promotion, are you actually going to make more money from a net perspective if, let's say, that promotion pushes you into the low end of a higher tax bracket? Mm, Exactly. And then it's important, I think, to think about the net because that's really the amount of money that you have to play with and that you have to use on your expenses. So, Lavania, I'm a little sad that we're at the end of our finance mini-series. Do you want to summarize where we've been during this time and and what we've learned? Sure. Well, we started with compound interest because that is something that is used throughout personal finances. And a thread that we've seen throughout this mini-series is that from compound interest to credit cards that use compound interest to calculate your interest to the debt-to-income ratio, which is your debt divided by your income, This math is not difficult and it's within your reach. And I think perhaps we shouldn't be afraid to do those calculations. Like one thing I learned while I was doing some research for debt aversion, for example, is that we don't fully understand as consumers how debt compounds. So I'm hoping that we've kind of inspired you with this mini series to go back at your own payments and your own finances and take a look at some of the math there. Thanks for listening, everyone. You can find us on Apple Podcasts, Spotify, Google Play, or wherever you find your podcasts. You can find the references we use for this episode in our show notes. A special thank you to Julian Bertino, who does our sound editing and music. Have an idea of what number we should cover in the future? Want to learn more? Find us on Instagram at The Secret Life of Numbers. We'll catch you next time on The Secret Life of Numbers, where the numbers can run, but they can't hide. Mm-hmm.